Good morning. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having invited me. Um, and secondly, I, of course, must heavily protest against the time limit, which for an academic is torture and just such as such a human rights violation. And uh, so to ask a professor to talk about sovereignty in cyberspace in 20 minutes is something that simply does not work. So I take the freedom of extending my time and the subject, of course. Um, first of all, uh, let me talk about shortly about uh, territorial sovereignty. Uh, it is a tautology, I hope to say, uh, that territorial sovereignty or full and exclusive authority implies that subject to, of course, applicable customary or conventional rules of international law, a state and the state alone is entitled to exercise jurisdiction especially by subjecting objects and persons within its territory to domestic legislation and to enforce these rules, as long as those objects and persons and the respective conducts are on that state's territory. This seems to also apply to all forms of communication, by the way, and that uh, also applies with regard to egress from or in access to the territory of a state. Now, if you hear something about territorial sovereignty, you may say, oh, yes, uh, this is uh, an ancient principle of international law. And, of course, it has been recognized by the International Court of Justice. It's customary in character. But what, for heaven's sake, does that have to do with cyberspace? And indeed, if you look into the literature, you will read things like cyberspace is characterized by anonymity, ubiquity, and uh, therefore, there is a growing tendency, obviously, to assimilate cyberspace to the high seas, international airspace, uh, the outer space. And uh, they consider cyberspace rather as a global common, or if I put it legally, a res communis omnium. Now, these characterizations, as true as they may be, they first of all merely justify one conclusion. And that is that cyberspace in its entirety, or cyberspace as such, is not subject to the sovereignty of a single state or of a group of states. So in view of its characteristics, of course, it is immune from appropriation. How would you appropriate cyberspace? But despite of that classification uh, of cyberspace as such, as a res communis, state practice, I believe, gives sufficient evidence that um, neither cyberspace nor the uh, necessary components thereof are immune from sovereignty and from the exercise of jurisdiction. On the one hand, states have exercised and will continue to exercise, I'm quite sure about that, their criminal jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis cyber crimes, and they continue to regulate activities in cyberspace. On the one hand, it is important to bear in mind that cyberspace requires physical architecture to exist. And the integration of physical compon components, that means of what we would call cyber infrastructure, located within a state's territory into the global domain of cyberspace cannot be understood as a waiver of the exercise of territorial sovereignty by the respective state. So in view of the genuine architecture of cyberspace, it may be difficult to exercise such sovereignty, I agree. Still, the technological and technical problems involved do, do not prevent a state from either exercising its sovereignty or its jurisdiction and to protect its cyber infrastructure against others. So, of course, the rules of international law, especially those on uh, sovereignty, jurisdiction, etc., they are not easily applicable to cyberspace in their traditional interpretation. In view of the indeed novel character of cyberspace and in view of the vulnerability of cyber infrastructure and cyber components, there is a noticeable uncertainty amongst governments and legal scholars as to whether the traditional rules and principles of customary international law are indeed sufficiently apt to provide the desired answers to some very worrying questions. It is therefore, I believe, of utmost importance that states not only agree on a common interpretation 
that takes into due consideration the unique attributes of networked technology. But it's also necessary that governments continue to work internationally to forge consensus regarding how norms of behavior apply to cyberspace. So if we agree that cyberspace uh, is not immune from the exercise of either territorial sovereignty or jurisdiction, we can first of all draw a conclusion. The first consequence is that the cyber infrastructure located in areas that, is, that are covered by the territorial sovereignty of a state is protected against interference by other states. This protection is not limited to activities amounting to an unjustified use of force, to an armed attack, or to a prohibited intervention. Rather, any activity attributable to another state, for example, because it constitutes an exercise of that state's jurisdiction, is to be considered a violation of the sovereignty of a territorial state. And this also holds true if the attributable conduct has negative impacts on the integrity or functionality of the cyber infrastructure. It is important to note that not every state conduct that impacts on the cyber infrastructure, however, necessarily constitutes a violation of the principle of territorial sovereignty. If the act of interference results in inflicting material damage to the cyber infrastructure, there seems to be sufficient consensus that such an act constitutes such a violation. In this context, however, it must be conceded that according to some, the damage inflicted must be severe. If, however, there is no or merely minor material damage to the cyber infrastructure, it is not really settled whether that activity can be considered a violation of the principle of territorial sovereignty. According to the United States International Strategy for Cyberspace, the follow following activities may qualify as violations of U.S. territorial sovereignty. Attacks on networks, exploitation of networks, and other hostile acts in cyberspace that threaten peace and stability, civil liberties, and privacy. So a rather far-reaching understanding. While the respective acts are not specified in that strategy, it seems that the U.S. government is advocating a rather wide scope of the principle of territorial sovereignty because it asserts the right to counter such acts with all necessary means. Moreover, we should not forget about the exercise of jurisdiction. The second consequence of the applicability of the principle of territorial sovereignty indeed is the wide-ranging wide right of the territorial state to exercise its jurisdiction over cyber infrastructure and over cyber activities. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, um, which, of course, is focused on territorial sovereignty, all the different forms of jurisdiction have not, been, have not to be elaborated upon. So the focus will have to be on the scope of territorial jurisdiction. Please keep that in mind. And a specific feature of territorial jurisdiction is, for example, the so-called effects doctrine according to which a state is entitled to exercise its jurisdiction not only over conduct that occurs on its territory, but also on conduct that is occurring on the territory of another state or in international space, and that have negative impacts, especially harmful effects, on its territory. This is rather settled. So what we can conclude with regard to um, jurisdiction, it is quite clear that uh, the principle of territorial sovereignty and the ensuing right of a state to exercise its ju territorial jurisdiction do apply to cyberspace insofar as the cyber infrastructure within the territory is concerned. The same holds true for individuals present in that territory or for conduct that either takes place within the territory or that produces harmful effects thereon. The exercise of jurisdiction under any of the recognized bases under international law is limited only where there exist explicit rules to that effect. The characteristics of cyberspace do not pose an obstacle to the exercise of territorial sovereignty and jurisdiction. However, uh, it's not only about protecting or being protected against harmful effects by others. There are also duties involved with the, the principle of territorial sovereignty. Now, in, in the literature, you can read uh, rather interesting statements with regard to the scope of that obligation of prevention. 
Now, it's of course clear that uh, all states are obliged to respect the territorial sovereignty of other states. And first of all, the obligation to respect the territorial sovereignty of other states applies to conduct that is attributable to a state. However, the International Court of Justice has clearly shown that there is also another obligation, which means that no state or every state is under, under an obligation not to allow knowingly its territory to be used for acts contrary to the rights of other states. Accordingly, a state is required under international law to take appropriate acts in order to protect the interests of other states. This obligation is not limited to criminal acts, but applies to all activities inflicting damage or at least severe damage or having the potential of inflicting such damage, whether on persons or objects that are all protected by the territorial sovereignty of the target state. Now, the duty of prevention in the context of cyber attacks has been correctly summarized as follows. States have an affirmative duty to prevent cyber attacks from their territory against other states. This duty actually encompasses several smaller duties to include prosecuting attackers and, during the investigation and prosecution, cooperating with the victim states of cyber attacks that originated from within their boundaries. But be aware that that duty of prevention presupposes knowledge. This does not necessarily mean actual knowledge, but let me remind you once again of the judgment by the International Court of Justice uh, that has held that even if a state on whose territory an act contrary to international law has occurred may be called upon to give an explanation, it cannot be concluded from the mere fact of the control exercised over its territory that that state necessarily knew or ought to have known of any unlawful act perpetrated therein. Hence, there are good reasons to conclude that the duty to pre uh, of prevention does not apply if the state from whose territory the respective acts have been committed has neither actual nor presumptive, presumptive slash constructive knowledge. Such a conclusion is, however, I must admit, not necessarily generally accepted. And there is a further situation that may have to be considered, at least as sufficient or as a very strong piece of evidence, or some would even say a rebuttable presumption. And that is the situation in which a cyber attack has been lodged from cyber infrastructure that is under the exclusive control of the government of another state. It does not mean that it must be owned by that government. Exclusive and overall control is sufficient. And finally, it may be added that state practice seems to justify the conclusion that there is a growing readiness of states to accept obligations that are of a more general character than the obligation to refrain from harmful conduct or to prevent such conduct. For instance, the United States president has taken the position that identifying the rules and principle of international law applicable to cyberspace must be guided by the broad expectations of peaceful and just interstate conduct to cyberspace. The US president emphasized that states need to recognize the international implications of their technical decisions and act with respect for one another's networks and the broader internet. And he demands that the emerging norms are guided by five criteria. Those are reliable access, multi-stakeholder governance, uh, global interoperability, network stability, and cybersecurity due diligence. And indeed, global interoperability is one of the main characteristics of the internet and of cyberspace. And it can only be preserved if, and to the extent that, states act within their authorities to help ensure the end-to-end -end interoperability of an internet that is accessible to all. Of course, you may ask, uh, that is all very nice, but what about attributability? Now, I won't talk about attributability, attributability because there is a full section devoted to that subject. But I admit, of course, that attributability continues to constitute not a legal problem, but rather a technical problem. And I'm just a stupid lawyer, and I cannot talk about technical issues. So in sum, I would uh, conclude that territorial sovereignty, 
has proven to be a powerful and effective norm of international law that can be applied to cyberspace without far-reaching modifications of that law. There certainly is not a necessity of new rules of international law. However, it may not be forgotten that this finding does not imply that all, state, uh, that all uh, aspects of the protection of territorial sovereignty have thus been clarified. For instance, there still is no consensus among states as to which cyber operations qualify as a prohibited use of force or as an armed attack. The rather abstract references to critical infrastructure in that context are, at, me, at least according to my position, not very helpful, especially if there is no consensus as to which objects and institutions are to be considered critical in nature. Equally effective, I may recall, is the concept of territorial jurisdiction. Accordingly, states are entitled to regulate cyber activities occurring within their territories and to enforce their domestic law. All those states enjoy an almost unlimited right to exercise their territorial jurisdiction with a view to cyber activities and cyber infrastructure within their territories. There is an undisputable need for an internationally agreed understanding that the Internet's functionality and thus the benefits it entails would be seriously challenged if states do not exercise their territorial jurisdiction with respect for one another's networks and the broader Internet. Therefore, the five criteria identified by the United States President in the International Strategy for Cyberspace should be taken up by other governments. They are of a potentially norm-creating character, and they would assist in a clarification of the existing rules and principles of international law that apply to the cyber domain. And finally, and I'm concluding three minutes ahead of time, uh, governments should cooperate with a view to improving their capabilities, of course, in the field of cyber forensics. Such cooperative efforts are necessary, not only in order to identify hackers or attackers, but also for a more effective deterrence of malevolent states and non-state actors. Thank you very much.